go. Let's start. Thank you for coming to this specific talk. Three minutes ago, this room was empty, so I'm, I was a bit worried. So thank you for choosing this one amongst the other choices. The title of this talk is Higher Order Infrastructure Microservices on the Docker Swarm. If you do like rank me for buzzwords, more buzzwords in a title, I think <laughs> this one does pretty good. Uh, so it captured your attention, hopefully. I will keep you entertained and informed for the past, for, for the next, not the past, uh, 40 minutes. Now, my name is Nicola Paolucci. I'm a developer advocate at Atlassian. We do Jira, Confluence, Bitbucket, HipChat, Bamboo. But in this specific case today, I'm here as an enthusiast of you know, containers and Docker, and I'll tell you why, and I'll, and I'll guide you through uh, you know, an experience uh, with some uh, live demos relating to orchestration, microservices, and Docker Swarm. I want to take you back. I want to take you back three years ago. Most of you probably know about Docker and know what it does. But I just want to recollect together why we got to this point where it's the, you know, our industry has been changed by this incredible trend towards you know, orchestration and containerization. Why did it happen? So the technologies to isolate the applic cloud applications and seal them and package them have been there for a while. So Google was already using containers 12 years ago. So all those technologies that made up the Docker core were, were, had been there for a while. What the Docker guys did, they made that sort of technologies approachable to a broader group of developers, let's say to the average software team. And so Docker came with a way to package an application a way to, to define and be very clear about the interfaces that the application, that specific application needed to have. So which ports to open, how to, which, which folders to mount into the application. Uh, it came with a caching layer to build incrementally, you know, different parts and, and uh, later parts of your application stack. And obviously a, a place where you could publish those deliverables, like, which is the Docker registry. So we all got very excited that there was a common format where we could package and deploy our application wherever Docker would run. And so what happened in the ecosystem in the past couple of years has been a movement to uh, a higher level of, of, of abstraction. So this movement towards orchestration. And the movement towards orchestration comes uh, it's very helpful for us software developers because we have to de worry less about the physical infrastructure uh, that we have and only worry about the relationships between the components of our application. So this is what the, the orchestration frameworks, and there's quite a few nowadays out there, bring us. So the ability to worry more about the logical relationships of our components and less about the physical infrastructure. And so this trend... Uh, forced us or is pushing the industry to think uh, in, in terms of tiny services that have a very unique and isolated, uh, isolated use. And this makes it in some, for, for some kinds of applications. Not all applications obviously benefit from moving to microservices, but for some, uh, rethinking your application in tiny components make it, makes, makes it easier to upgrade, easier to reason about, it makes it uh, easier to reason about. You can think about your architecture uh, at a much higher level of abstraction without worrying about the infrastructure details. And obviously, these orchestration tools come with uh, the concerns of high availability and scaling already baked in. It doesn't mean that scaling out a microservices architecture is easy. Nothing is easy, especially as you grow and you want to go at full scale. But those frameworks, and we'll see one today, we'll see Docker Swarm today, can really help you with you know, the high availability and the scaling part of this new cloud world where we live in. And this was my introduction. Only three minutes. Nice. So apart from the theory, what I would like to do with you today is to work through a real example. And a real example of a microservice is actually polyglot. See, that was the other buzzword that I forgot to, to put in the title. Polyglot microservices. So different technologies for each of the service. And show you how we can deploy it on a cluster automatically without specifying a single IP address. I know some of you are looking at me and your level of interest is like this. Yeah? But some of you, which are the super enthusiasts, are looking at me like this. Help me. 
I want to see it. Yes, so I, I hope all of you guys are in this uh, second category. So I want to just give you a brief disclaimer, and that is to be able to fit all this into uh, for 40 minutes, I had to skip a couple of the concerns that you would have in a, you know, in a full production ready microservices architecture. So don't come and hunt me down if there's a couple of things that are missing. They're missing on purpose, it's just for the sake of time. The example we'll be vo working through together is uh, uh, a s very simple web application, which you might have seen in some of the demos of Docker Compose, but we'll take it to the next level. We'll deploy it fully on a, on a cluster on Docker Swarm with a reverse proxy in front, and we'll do uh, many more things that you might have seen with it. The application is simple. There's um, uh, an application for voting on options, and there's an application where you can read the results. So at uh, first look, this would be relatively easy to do in a monolithic application with a database backend. Shouldn't be too complicated, right? But you know we're living in a microservices world now. We want to make sure that we can scale out and, and we can have different teams working on different parts of this service. So this is how I imagine we could re rethink this simple application using microservices. And if my head is cutting parts of this, let me know. Uh, I'm going to step out. So what we want, we want uh, the, the user hits, uh, you know, uh, a load balancer and an Nginx reverse proxy that uh, can direct the user to the proper uh, applications. And then there's a voting application, which is written in Python. And the voting application needs to be very responsive and, and, and process a lot of traffic. So it doesn't store data immediately into a relational database. It stores data into a key value store using Redis. And then we have a worker written in Java who actually picks the, the keys out of the key value store and moves them into a more permanent database, uh, Postgres. And the result application actually wants to present proper, accurate data. So we, we read the data from the Postgres uh, database. And the, the results application is written in Node.js using Socket.io so that it can dynamically refresh the data in real time. So fairly interesting. It's a simple application, but it's non-trivial. And it is fairly well split. Now, uh, to be able to, to deploy all this onto a cluster, we need a few things. And that is where we'll see all the components in Docker's own ecosystem, how they can uh, help us uh, do this. So the first component is we need a way to provision a machine that uh, runs Docker and knows that it's, uh, that it's part of a, of a cluster, and knows uh, when to uh, advertise itself as up or down, and so on. Then we need something to a high-level description, say a sort of a language or a configuration file, to link the services together, specifying on which ports they need to run, uh, who to talk to, we, and, and, so, and so on. And we'll see a, a, a lot of details about that. Then we need a cluster manager. We need something that keeps track of uh, what machines are available and which machines are under stress and where we can deploy the applications and where we can scale them out. Cluster manager. And then there's a whole host of you know, side, con side um, 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 areas that we need to worry about. So the nodes need to be on the same network. So we need something that creates a, an overlay network uh, so that all the, the machines can talk to each other. We need a way to mount volumes across those machines. We need the, uh, the all sorts of those concerns. For each of these, these things, Docker's ecosystem came out with a tool to help us out. For to provision machines, we can use Docker machines, which supports a vast number of interfaces as a service providers where you can create machines on the fly that run Docker and that can join your, your, your cluster. To define services, we will use Docker Compose. We use a high-level configuration file to link the services together. Manage the nodes, uh, we'll use Docker Swarm. And then nowadays, Docker is moving towards a very strong uh, plugin architecture. So nowadays, managing networks, managing volumes uh, are um, extendable plugins inside the Docker uh, command itself. So uh, apart from the Docker's own tool, we'll need to solve some other problems, like, for example, we need a reverse proxy that will be at the front of our application catching all the initial, initial traffic and direct it to the proper service. We need uh, something to, you know, maybe distributed logging. We will need a, a discovery service that keeps the pace of which machines are available or not. And some of these will cover, some of these, you know, will, I will, uh, you know, uh, elegantly overlook. Uh, so 
on the, if you look at the physical infrastructure, as we are thinking about our architecture, what I think we will need for this, uh, for this uh, demo, we will need, uh, obviously, a master, a cluster master. The cluster master will need to keep, um, to, uh, keep a tab on which machines are available using a discovery service. So we'll have a machine with a discovery service on top. Then we'll need a machine that, that's going to handle the reverse proxy stuff. One or more machines that will handle the actual services, the results application, the voting application, and the workers, and maybe a much a beefier machine to handle you know, our database workloads. This is what I would like. And uh, we would like the Swarm, Docker Swarm to handle that for, for us. Because I haven't told you anything yet about Docker Swarm, let me give you a very brief uh, high-level overview of what the Docker Swarm is. And Docker Swarm is a, a tool that allows you to run Docker commands as you would run on a single machine, but on a whole cluster of machines. So you just, uh, that is one of the beauties and also the key differentiator between the other orchestration uh, frameworks that you might have uh, encountered, because you, to use Docker Swarm, you just run normal Docker commands. You attach to them some environment variables and specify other things to it, but um, that's, a, that's a big power, so you don't need to learn something new. The architecture of Docker Swarm, I, you probably have already understood it. There's a, there's a Swarm master. You have to keep track of which machines are part of the cluster. It uses a discovery service, which, which can be of your choice. There's quite a few popular uh, in the open source world nowadays. There's etcd, uh, there's, uh, there's console. And uh, the, sw the Swarm master knows how to talk to some nodes. So there's a Swarm agents running on each of the nodes that, uh, and so the Swarm master can deploy containers and run applications on each of those. For the case of this demo that I'm talking about and I haven't shown you anything yet, we will use the, uh, as a discovery service from the ASHICorp console. Now, the first step is uh, creating the physical infrastructure. To create the physical infrastructure, I already told you we can use Docker Machine. Docker Machine is a very useful command line utility that allows you to create machines on the fly that have Docker installed and, if we need it, that are part of a, of a cluster. So it works uh, like this. To create a new machine, you do Docker machine, create, and then the driver, minus D, actually represents the, provide, the in, in, uh, internet service provider that you want to use. You can use, uh, you know, deploy to your local machine, to a virtual machine, or you can use a provider. In this case, I've used DigitalOcean, but you can use a Google Cloud, you can use AW, uh, Amazon, you can use um, a, number of, a wide number of, uh, of providers. And then you need to specify some keys, like an authentication key, so that you, um, you, can, um, you, can, you, know, you can be built for the machines you create. You can specify in which region you want it to be created, uh, which, how much disk you want, how much RAM, and also a, lot, a lot of parameters to specify how you want to create the machine. In this specific case, I'm actually showing you the command to create the discovery service, which I just call console. But we were talking about four machines that are going to be part of a cluster, so we need uh, to change a little bit the command to specify that the machine will be part of a cluster. To do that, we just need to add a few more flags to Docker machine command. Now, don't get scared. It's not too hard. It's Docker machine create, the driver. And then if you want to create a machine that's going to be part of a cluster, you add the dash dash swarm. Uh, flag, and if it's the Swarm master, you want to specify it. And all that's below there, uh, it's just a way to, every machine needs to know where to adverse, advertise itself to the discovery service when it comes up, when it goes down. So we specify how to connect to our console discovery service by passing those par extra parameters. Now, because I want to show you that I'm not uh, lying, we're just going to show you briefly the script I created, which contains all the Docker machine statements. We don't have to, I'm sorry, I have to reshow you. So I created briefly a script, because otherwise this would uh, take a bit long to type on the screen. So those are all my uh, Docker machine statements. The only thing I wanted to point out here, and you'll see there's like five of them, I run, I want to make sure that I run actually console on the console machine. And then the other thing I wanted to show you very briefly is uh, that we can label boxes. We can add uh, 
labels. So for example, if I add this engine label, instance equals R proxy, what it means is that that specific machine will be labeled R proxy. And when I deploy workloads on our, my cluster, I'll be able to specify to which tags to deploy our, our applications. This will be one of the ways that we tell Docker Swarm how to, um, where to deploy our machines. So you can see that the services box will, uh, has a tag called service. All right. We don't have to go into more, many more details. Maybe you just want to see it happen. So let's run it. Now, depending on the provider you're using, this might take some time. So I'm just sped up a little bit this, because otherwise it would take a few more minutes than the ones we have. So this is going out and actually creating a full cluster of five machines ready for us. All those clusters will know that they are part of a swarm, mass, a swarm cluster and will be able and will be able to deploy containers, run containers onto them. So you see the reverse proxy has been created, the services machine has been created. I'm just going to speed up a little bit here. Yeah, so, so the, the end result, if I do Docker machine ls to list all the machines I created, grabbing some because I have many more than the ones you see. Uh, you see now I have created five machines. And if I want to inspect the swarm, I can uh, you know, evaluate a few environment variables and, uh, so that I can run Docker commands across the entire cluster. So I do this by doing Docker machine env, dash just swarm, the name of my master. And then I can type Docker info. And uh, I can, you can see there, maybe I can point it. See, we have four, four nodes available. And, um, the rest is a lot of information. You can see all the tags associated with the nodes and, and so on. So do not get scared by the whole so much blank screen because uh, we just show you an overview. Yeah, so we show you an overview. Yeah, there you go. So what we did, we just created five machines. One is not part of the cluster, is the discovery service. The other ones are part of the cluster. And if you go and look in DigitalOcean uh, on uh, how many machines I'll be billed for, this is what you see. And I'm billed by the second on the, or by the minute on the use of this. So day by day, this has been accumulating. And, and uh, it's not too much money, but uh, you know, it's piling up. Uh, so after we did this, we are done with creating the machines. So now this, just to remind you what we just did so that you have it fresh in your memory, this is what we created. A Swarm Master, a discovery service, a reverse proxy, some services boxes, in this case one, and a database machine. Now, what this, uh, now that we have a Swarm properly configured, what that does this gives, uh, give us? What it does give us is the ability to deploy applications on the entire swarm using high-level forms, high-level uh, abstractions. So Docker Swarm has a few strategies on how it deploys load to the machines. It can use a spread strategy, so try to use as many machines as possible to spread the load evenly across the cluster. It has a strategy called beam pack, which uh, might be sensible for some applications where you want to actually pack as much uh, power and as much computing power on as, as little, as little uh, number of machines as possible. And then it has filters. So as you deploy applications on the various machines, you can specify, um, I want to run this machine only when I have X gigs of RAM available. I only want to run these applications when I have, where I have an SSD. Or you can specify affinities, like uh, run this logging service uh, together on the same machine of the applications that it needs to log. Otherwise, it wouldn't make, make much sense. But as you can see, we're specifying slightly higher level um, concerns uh, and not specific machine, machine addresses or names. So ideally, if we did things right, what, this, what should happen with this architecture is that we'll, uh, we'll deploy the reverse proxy, Nginx, onto the reverse proxy machine. Uh, the, services, the services box will hand, have handle until it can some of our services, like the result application, the, no, the, the voting application in Python, the workers. And on the database machine, we want to run Postgres, and just for the sake of this demo, also Redis. And we want the applications to be able to talk to the database, obviously, all without uh, configuring things too much. OK. To, need the, the, to link things across a cluster, I will need, at one point, a piece of configuration, right? And so to do that, we'll use Docker Compose. Docker Compose is, uh, is, a, is a command line tool that comes with a configuration file that you need to provide 
to describe at a high level how your services are connected to each other, in which order they should be started, which ports should be opened. And um, now we'll go through the, through the configuration ourselves. I know, I know you're all eagerly anticipating, that's why I put this image up, and to see how, how this is done, how do I do it with the configuration file. And so let's do it. Uh, it's the configuration file of Docker Compose is relatively readable. It's a YAML format. This is the version 2. It came out just a few weeks ago and allows us to specify separately volumes and networks, which we're not going to go in too deeply into today. But as you can see, we specify that our voting application, we can specify an image in one of our registry where the release that we want to deploy is. Right now, we're just going to deploy the latest version, but you could specify the, the release tag that you want to deploy. Or if you're doing this locally, you could specify uh, where the source of, of, the, of your um, application is running. We specify which ports the application runs uh, internally, port 80, and we specify which other services it depends upon. This is also fairly recent, depends on, uh, has been added recently, and it's very useful for Docker Compose. You can specify, um, yeah, which other services should be up before you can use the voting application. Uh, the interesting part is at the bottom, where we specify the environment some environment variables. Some of the environment variables are the ones that are used by Docker Swarm to define where and how this application will be deployed. So you see here I add the constraint instant, instance equals service because we tagged one of the machines as being for services. So when Docker Compose runs this, it will run it and deploy it onto the uh, services machine. And uh, we need to tell the reverse proxy at one point that we want whenever there's a voting application uh, starting up, it needs to be, you know, uh, respond to a, to a domain that's vote.cluster.local. This is how we'll communicate to the reverse proxy. We'll see more of that in a bit. So just to go quickly to the other parts of the configuration, the results application is very simple. It's exactly the same. The only change is that instead of depending on Redis, it depends on the, on the Postgres database. And we want it to respond to a, a different domain, maybe a step down. Uh, to a different domain, which is the results.cluster.local. For uh, the worker, it's very simple, actually bare. The only thing is that, that the uh, worker needs, uh, it needs actually to depend on both Redis and the database, because it's going to be copying data from the key value store to Postgres. And we also specify that we want to deploy it on a machine that's ready to serve services. I just uh, took the vanilla setups for uh, uh, Redis and Postgres. You might need to customize this as you uh, prepare a proper, properly configured uh, production solution. Uh, Redis runs on a certain port. And this, in this case, I've, I was a bit more specific. Instead of specifying uh, a tag or a label, I specified a node where I wanted the machine to run. So you can actually be uh, more explicit and say, I wanted the node that I called DB and the same for uh, Postgres image. There's one bit missing, which I know you're eager to check, and that is, how do I do the part that where I need a dynamic proxy that whenever a voting application comes online, or if I'm scaling it out, more instances of a voting application come up, I need something that refreshes the rules of the, my load balancer and drives traffic to it. So we're in luck. We're using a project called uh, Nginx proxy. Nginx proxy uh, allows us to do just that. It's, uh, it's going to monitor all containers starting and stopping across the entire cluster. And if those containers have an environment variable called virtual host, it will refresh the Nginx configuration serving that service uh, transparently. Now, you see something different here, and that is an environment file. Uh, instead of defining the environment variables uh, one by one in there, I put a file there. And the reason for this is that you cannot execute commands inside the Docker file configuration. So uh, to, to go around that, I can run a command, and it will generate some environment variables. What I need is basically the IP address of the Swarm master. That way, I'll be able to intercept all creation, the creation of all containers uh, across um, the Swarm. I've gave you a lot of configuration, and I apologize for that. So 
I know you guys are ready. Are you ready? Where is my demo? I know most of you are thinking, where is my demo, Lebowski? <laughs> yes, so if I don't show you a demo, this is what you'll do to me. So we have all the steps now to actually get it to run. And I hope it's not too anticlimactic. Let's see. So uh, the trick to start up Docker Compose, once I have a configuration, is you type Docker Compose up minus D to send it in the background. And what, what happens is very anticlimactic. I have sped it up a little bit. All the images that are needed are pulled on the machines. And they are started and linked as we have specified. So if that's true, if I type Docker Compose, PS, you'll see that I have a database, a proxy, Redis, result application, the voting application, the worker. Everything syncs correct. They all seem to running on some IP addresses. So if I go and open a browser and go to vote.cluster.local, I see the voting application is properly redirected to uh, vote.cluster.local by the reverse proxy. If I vote and I go and check the logs, so Docker Compose logs, you will see that actually I have been processed. The worker has been processing a vote. And so everything seems to be working. So now the worker has copied the, 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 the vote to the database. So if I go to the result application, I should see the results. And you can see 100% dogs. Now you'll see in the logs a little bit many pings coming from Socket.io refreshing the data. And I want to prove you that if I open an anonymous session and vote again, those will equalize. So I'm cheating a little bit by playing by like two users on a single computer. So those are the pings coming from Socket.io. So if I vote for cats now, it will uh, equalize. So OK, I wasn't cheating the system is working as uh, anticipated. The other thing I wanted to show you is, did the services end up on the, on the right machine that we had designed initially? So if I do Docker PS and I see across uh, Docker Swarm where our things have been deployed, I can see that the Node.js application is running uh, on the services, on the services machine I've created. The Python application is running on the services machine as well. The Postgres is running on the database machine, which is uh, what I wanted. And the, the reverse proxy has been deployed to the reverse proxy. So things see, it seems that things have been working out uh, well. OK. Magic. OK. So now, this thing wouldn't be as beautiful as it would be if uh, I wouldn't be able to make use of these facilities I told you before about high availability and resilience. And so because we're using a tool that's made up to scale out to huge loads. So let me show you how, how we would go about scaling up part of this application. Let's say that the services machine has become um, overloaded and we need to scale up to a different machine, to a new machine. So first, what I need to do is to, to create a new machine, maybe as allocated for the services. So I'm going to call it services2. And uh, I'm, I'm just going to, the important thing is that I tag it. The important thing is that I tag it uh, for services. That way, uh, our Docker Compose will be able to know where to deploy the, the, the scaling up of those um, you know, the result application. And I, this will create in real time, or this will create a new machine. I sped this up just a tiny bit. Goes to uh, DigitalOcean and creates a new machine for us. And uh, let's see if it's up and running. I type docker machine ls. Yes, you see there's an extra machine available. It has a different IP address. OK. And so now if I want to scale up, it's, it's a little bit anticlimactic because I can just do a tell docker compose to scale uh, one application up to x instances, and it will just happen. So let's see. So this is just to show you again. All the applications are still running. And if I do docker compose scale result application, actually, there's a small typo. 
result application equals four. Let's say we want to make sure that the result application has been hammered. It was hit, you know, Hacker News, the first story on Hacker News. We want to scale it out. You just uh, type enter, and um, it's done. It says it's done. So let's check what happened. If I do Docker PS, ah, you see I have a few more applications running there. Actually, they have been deployed on services too because we're using a spread strategy. And so the result application, there's many more instances of them, all exposing a random port on that other uh, uh, machine. And let's just check for the sake of checking that I'm not cheating, that they're actually up and running and they are serving traffic. And uh, so that's, uh, that's still serving the result application. So that is, that is working. Now, the next bit to show you uh, would be to um, uh, trace somehow through the, the reverse proxy if this machine is actually serving traffic. And uh, we would need to do, we could do it in a couple of ways, but because we're sort of running short of time, I will leave, leave this. You will have, have to believe me, or you have to come to my machine after the talk, and I'll show it to you. But this is more or less what I wanted to show you. And there's a couple final things I wanted to mention. Uh, see, I see, actually. So I'm just showing you that uh, we scaled it up to two other instances. OK, so what I wanted to show you as, as ending thoughts is the orchestration tools of the Docker ecosystem have been maturing over time. and they have been becoming, they have already production ready, but they've been becoming more and more and more robust over time. So uh, more recently, uh, changes to, to Docker Compose came up. As I said, new first class citizens of the Docker Compose configuration across your services, volumes, and networks. Uh, much better support for you know, overlay networks across the Swarm cluster. Um, now, just in the recent uh, release of Docker Swarm, there is a new flag for Swarm that allows you to uh, redeploy containers on node failure. So if a node goes down, the containers that were running there will be started somewhere else. And more very recently, uh, the first version of Docker that's actually uh, have, has been rebuilt on the open container initiative uh, uh, sources. So that makes like Docker um, you know, compatible, or at least built on the same open technologies of other solutions that are coming out of the orchestration um, of the containerization uh, you know, revolution, other vendors, other projects. This is more or less what I had for you today. So I want to first thank you for being very attentive. And uh, if you'd like to follow me on Twitter, that's my Twitter account. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, you thank you, thank you. There, depending on the time, there might be time for some questions. Ah, there's a question in the back. Yeah, so what the node balancer does, it, it receives the streams of all the containers that are started and stopped uh, from the swarm. And it's intercepting all, it receives really a stream of those events. And so when a container is started up that has a virtual host environment variable, in this case it will be results.cluster.local, it will uh, add it to the upstream list of Nginx. So it will start around to round robbing around, around that machine as well. So yeah, I didn't show it. I didn't show it. I thought I was running completely out of time. So that's my answer for you. Other things? Ah. You basically deployed that uh, you scale the same application version, right? So what if I want to scale with a new version of my application? Yeah, so uh, it's a... It's a yeah, so that, that in that case, you need to change the, the Docker Compose YML, right? So you change the image that you want to deploy. So Docker Compose will read always, read and validate your configuration. So if you have, uh, uh, I didn't show it in these configurations, but you, you will have a tag at the end of, you know, you're, you're taking from the registry a certain version of your application. So if you, if you tag and version your applications, you change the version, the versions that you're scaling up to will be on the new one. So, so uh, 
you will not have downtime if you scale, uh, scale up other images that those new ones uh, will run on the new version. And then you might need to, you might need to manually shut down if you're, if you're going this way, the other ones your, your way. There will be and there are tools coming out that will do this sort of overseeing uh, automatically. But I think for, for what I showed you, it will be manual. manual. Other things? Ah, somebody there. So I didn't show it to you. I had, I had a, a part of it where I could show you, um, for example, the Nginx. So everything, every communication of the Docker Swarm is actually using TLS and SSL certificates. So to be, for, for example, to be able to use um, um, th that the Nginx proxy can receive the stream of Docker Swarm events, it needs to have the, certi the proper certificate. So in, in that specific case, you need to copy the certificates uh, on the machine where the, the proxy will run. Otherwise, it will not intercept. So there are, there are all uh, Docker Swarm communications and Docker communications are secured. But I'm not an expert in the security of these uh, setups. So I know there, are, there have been online night talks about sec uh, securing containers. It's a hot topic. I'm not an expert about it, though. This, should, this is what I know. Other things? No other things? Then, thanks again. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>